I made an unboxing video when I got this knife back in July of 2020 and I can't find it. So I lost it somehow, so we can't go back to review that. But here we are in December of 2020 and this knife is coming back down into the shop. It is still the highest performing knife in my kitchen, hands down, no questions asked there. Uh, it has held a dynamite edge. I'm excited to bring back a as new, or I'm, I'm considering maybe a better than new edge on this blade today. Also, the tip has been broken off, so I'm going to repair that tip. And there's also a ding in the blade and I want to use that to illustrate that this knife is sold as the perfect kitchen knife. And for some people, like myself, this might be the perfect kitchen knife. I'm extremely happy with this. Uh, however, this is not the perfect kitchen knife for everybody. All right, what's up, guys? Uh, welcome to episode 51 of the Thursday Night Grind. Here we are, December 17th, 2020. And this Thursday Night Grind, like them all, are brought to you by the Guild of Professional Sharpeners. And I'm excited about everything going on in there. Some things, some highlights that stand out for me this week include Zach getting his boxes up. And uh, that's awesome. Like, what a big move. That's where that's his system to um, bring uh, for customers to drop gear off and then for him to get it back to them. It's been uh, several of us have made that that work really well. And then Jason has been doing a lot of work around researching the, the right gear that's right for him. And that's been a fun learning experience for all of us. There's, there's a ton more going on and it's spanning everything from like uh, John shared kind of like an ethics value uh, um, issue that came up with a knife that uh, he, he felt he didn't do his best work on and like the reasons why that is. And uh, we, we you know, all the way into like SEO and building a website and stuff. So it's, it's, it's really cool. It's a lot of fun. If the idea of sharpening or monetizing a sharpening uh, skill is interesting to you, then you should check out the Guild of Professional Sharpeners. And you can learn more about that at guildofsharpeners.org. And also some other really fun stuff that's been going on for me has been some preparation for something that's going to be happening here really soon. And the best way to learn about that is to get on my email list. And the best way to get on my email list is to uh, hit that 21 reasons to start a sharpening business. And that will get you into my weekly newsletter. In addition to the 21 reasons, which I, I explain, which are all valid. Uh, and there are more too. But anyway, all that to say, get on the email list. It's a weekly newsletter on top of uh, something that I'm working on making available uh, soon. Okay, without further ado, let's talk about this Carter Cutlery Perfect Kitchen Knife. First, I want to orient ourselves to this knife and uh, understand what's going on. Because if you don't know, it might just look like any other knife. But this is the Carter Cutlery Perfect Kitchen Knife made in the Muteki series, which is the group of people who have worked through Murray Carter's uh, program for knife making, bladesmithing. That's what these symbols are. This knife is made by Ryan Cavallo, which is um, what that print symbolizes. And uh, he's also the maker of my neck knife, which has come up in the Thursday Night Grind before. What's going on with this knife is it is a Sanmai construction, which means it is actually three layers of steel forge welded together with a stainless steel on the outside and then a white number one high carbon steel on the inside. And that white number one doesn't mean that the steel is white. It is just the name. It's actually because it was like the color of the label, I think, uh, in it's made in one foundry in Japan and they have like, like white and blue one, two and whatever. If you see that, it, 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 uh, my understanding is it just refers to the color that the company put the, made the label. Found that the lighting wasn't working for me there. So here we are. Uh, this is um, what's going on here. You can see the line from that white number one, which is a high carbon steel and then the, the stainless on the outside. Anyway, so that's uh, to me in and of itself, the fact that three layers of steel are forge welded into this thickness is kind of amazing. Nice job, guys. And what we get there is the, you know, the, ma the majority of the blade is protected by the stainless steel, which everybody loves because it's low maintenance. But then the cutting edge gets the performance of the high carbon steel, specifically the white number one. And that is why this Sanmai construction exists and why Carter, Murray Carter and Carter Cutlery have uh, 
really built their name around it. Okay, so let's talk about this sold as the perfect kitchen knife. Like for me, it is awesome, but I'm also willing to care for it. If you're not willing to care for it, this knife is not for you specifically. And I hate to call my wife out here, but the broken tip and the ding, uh, those are things where uh, unfortunately um, it was, I think it was used in, to open a squash or maybe it fell into the sink or something like that for those events, um, which, uh, this is a this is a delicate knife, right? Uh, that said, like it's it's a champ. The the way that I care for this knife is I use it, I wash it, I dry it, and I put it back in the block. And I mean, like I don't go eat and then do that. I mean, like what you know, as I'm plating up my food, this knife gets put back in the storage. And um, not everybody is willing to do that. So that for those people, this knife is not a perfect knife. This knife would be a total pain in the neck. And then what happens if you don't properly care for it, this, if you leave this knife uh, on the cutting board, man, like even like during dinner, uh, you're going to come back and you're going to see a stained finish on here, uh, that carbon steel. It'll rust up that quick, build a, a solid patina. And if you left this knife out overnight or like left it in the sink, you would be so frustrated with, with how it looked. You'd be like, what? It, this is disgraceful, but it's by design. So Anyway, just understand that. And that's, you know, I, I share all that to say that I have a hard time uh, like selling knives or getting into that space because everybody has a different taste and there's about a million different knives available. And I would, I, you know, the, everybody, you, viewer, and everybody else should find the knife that's the best fit for you and run with that with a willingness to explore other options. And for me, this is a great knife, but it is not for everybody. So what are we going to do today? We're going to repair that tip. We are probably not going to do a lot about the ding uh, by taking a few. It's, it's not terrible. Um, every now and then I can find it. But anyway, there's not much I'm going to do about that. It's right there. Can't, uh, I can see it. You're not going to be able to see it. But just a little ding, a little bend in the steel. Uh, maybe a few passes. We'll, over time, we'll work past that ding, assuming we don't make it worse. It's not a chip. It's just that the metal has bent a little bit. And then we're going to sharpen it. I'm going to sharpen this in the series that I'm using now, which is a cutting a bevel on the 1x30 um, and then going through the, a series of belts on the work sharp. I'm going to, next time I do this knife, my plan is to do it on the Edge Pro and then get some at least uh, anecdotal evidence of a difference between the two sharpening methods. And um, that is really for my own benefit for the time being, but... Uh, I'm just a perpetual curiosity about how uh, all the different ways to sharpen knives and, and all that. So anyway, let's, uh, I think I'm good there, I'm done rambling. Let's go first re repair this tip and then uh, the rest of it will be uh, probably a voiceover. First, let's orient ourselves to the 1x30 belt sander. I got the edge core ceramic 120 grit belt. I just uh, got these from Red Label Abrasives and I'm a super fan. Doug put me on to ceramic belts and I will probably never go back to aluminum oxide. Love them. All right, I'm doing real light passes, not using the platen, though I do have a platen upgrade that I'm excited to share with the guild here in the near future. See me scoping it out here. I'm looking for that burr. That's my biggest indicator that I'm build. I'm, I'm at the edge. If you're not building a burr, you're not at the edge. Real light passes. And notice I do have tip repair to do, but I'm cutting my bevel. I'm getting my bevel situated first because the more work I do on the bevels, the less work I have to do on the tip. But I also like working, like repairing tips from the spine. <clears throat> which we are conveniently going to right now. Right now I'm reaching for my water, which is gonna be off camera, but you'll see me using it here. So again, uh, I've pulled back the very top guard on this, and I'm also wearing my safety goggles, which you don't see. Light passes, dipping in water. This is real thin, delicate steel. I'm doing like almost no pressure touching it with my hands, that my fingers there, you see that? That pulls any slag off and it also gives me some feedback on how much heat I'm putting into the blade. I spent a couple seconds on it. That was just me measuring the temperature. Clean it off, measure the temperature. Cool it off in the water. 
Coming back with the, uh, I just wanted to comment too, with the guard up there pulled back, you can do some rounding around that top pulley. I've needed to do that on some other blades, uh, but for this, I'm just strictly doing light work on the, on the slack belt portion. Working the spine down, following the curvature of the knife to form a new tip. Bear in mind when you do this, you're gonna put up a little burr on either face of the blade. And you're gonna have to get that off. But I'll show you how I do that. All right, so that, oh no, you know what I'm gonna do now? So now, because like I was saying, I put up a little burr everywhere. I'm gonna take one more light pass along the length of the knife to, uh, in case there's a little burr that has formed over the tip of the knife where I was doing that work. <clears throat> Pretty shallow angle there, right? Catch that? This knife uh, can accommodate a nice shallow angle. Okay, so here we are <clears throat> on the work sharp system. This is the course belt. I'm doing the same sort of work on the spine of the knife. I like to match the finish of the whole spine. And here I am real light. I just took that burr off. Here, let's do the other side. Just took that burr out. That was a little tougher. Camera's a little kind of in the way to get the best shot there, but it's good. Here I am, I'm checking the surface finish, feeling the surface finish. Do a little bit more work there. Nice and gentle, easy does it. Feeling all that, that should be nice and smooth, no major transitions. And now we work the bevel. I already set this to 18 degrees on all of the systems. <clears throat> nice light pressure, about an inch per second. Don't run the tip off the edge of the belt. And then you'll also notice, like you can kind of get the feel for where the blade is touching the belt. You wanna make sure you get to the tip, but not past it. <clears throat> Checking for a burr. With these, uh, with these metals, sometimes it's hard to see the burr like it is with others. But that is good on the coarse belt, so we'll go over to the fine belt. Again, working the spine a little bit just to have the, an indetectable transition from the way the knife maker left it to the way I am leaving the repair on that tip. Feeling it right there. It's going to need just a little bit of refinement. Feels good. Let's work the bevel some more. Also, you might notice that I'm situating myself right near the pulley that is closest to me. I'm using that as kind of a line so that I'm always touching the belt in the same place. Understand if you go more into the center between the pulleys, you're gonna get a, the most convex grind. Whereas out here by the where it just comes around that pulley, that's gonna be closer to a flat grind. I'm doing two passes on either side. And with this knife, again, that pretty much pulled the burr right off. So it's uh, not as detectable with this blade as it is with uh, some other knives. Next belt, that was the fine belt that we just did on the WorkSharp. Next one here, this is the leather strop with white compound from red label abrasives. You'll see a pile of stuff over there. I'm still trying to figure out what I like most as this finishing step on the work sharp system. Uh, I'm trying to give the leather its, uh, its fair share. I'm gonna try to run a hundred knives over it, see how it breaks in and how I like it compared to the cloth belt that is sold by work sharp. Nice, light, easy passes here. I'm gonna be doing two passes per, per side again. That's a pretty steady hand. I'll confess with uh, the camera overhead, my positioning isn't perfect and I felt like I did not have the same degree of stability that I do when it's just me down here in the shop grinding away. Here we go. All right, hat tip to Tim. I should be doing a cut test off, uh, off all of these. So here we go, bring the 
putting some nice thin paper in. Seems good. Get the whole thing. Now it just gets to be kind of fun, right? Like once you start doing, oh yeah, oh, let's do that. Yo, before we go, I just want to close out. This is right out of Murray Carter's book, and it starts there. There are, there are three approaches to selecting steel for the purpose of forging blades. Research, recycle, or just get the best steel. And that, I love the audacity there. It's like if you, uh, and that's why, he, you know, that's his thing. Like, that's the best steel. And that white number one, like, it is good. But again, I just want to close out here. Like maybe that is the perfect steel for me because I'm right. I'm, I'm willing to care for it. Right. Like I'm a knife nut and uh, I'm going to hand wash it and put it away. And like, I'm going to oil it if I'm going to leave it for any period of time. And if I ding it, I'm going to fix it. Like, uh, but that might not be, and I'm also willing to pay over 300 bucks for it. Right. Like, so all of those things make it a good knife for me, but it, doesn't necessarily mean that is the perfect kitchen knife. It's just the perfect kitchen knife for me. And if you, um, I just want to encourage you to like pursue whatever the perfect knife is for you. Anyway, I hope you dug that. And I hope you pulled a few nuggets out of there that you can carry with you into your own shop. If you did derive any value, I'd ask that you please subscribe to my channel, hit the thumbs up and leave a comment. I would appreciate that. And also, uh, it'd be great if you visited my shop, and uh, there's a link for that in the description. And lastly, the, the, thing, the best thing you could probably do for yourself, especially if you're interested in, in learning this skill and then learning how to monetize it, would be to get onto my email list. And the best way to do that is to download 21 Reasons to Start a Sharpening Business. Thank you so much. And we are coming up on the holiday season here, but I think I'm going to see you one more time uh, before we close out 2020. So until next week, have a great week and happy grinding.